So, Carl Norva, um, Norway is quite a small country. It's about the same population as Scotland. And you have this towering genius of Munch, uh, who everyone's heard of. I mean, the scream is, I think, one of two paintings in the world that is actually an emo a sort of official emoji. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> um, and seems, I think, particularly at the moment, that image, maybe it always seems to sum up a certain um, in terror, but at the moment it feels, I mean, we all want to clamp our hands over our ears and scream. Um, but tell me, how, how was it for you growing up? Yeah, when did you first encounter the paintings of Edvard Munch, the work of Edvard Munch? I don't know, because um, as you said, Munch, uh, Norway is a very little country, and Munch is a very big artist. I remember his images being on our school books, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like the sun was on one, galloping horse was on another. It was like his images just were floating around. Which makes it very difficult to see Munch for a Norwegian, because to see his paintings, what he's painting, what the paintings are, are difficult because we see Munch, you know. If you take the Scream as the best example, it's a painting about many things, but it is also, you know, a painting about anxiety, something terrible. If you have had anxiety, you know how terrible that is. And somehow that painting made it possible then in, in the 1890s to break through and to, to um, kind of give an impression of that, but immediately an impression of that. But all we see is Munch, all we see is, you know, a billion dollar, all we see is the iconic, uh, the iconic, the iconic Munch. And, yeah. But, as you write so eloquently about in this book, he painted 1,789 works. Yeah. Or produced, actually. I'm not sure whether that's paintings or works. So he had an absolutely vast output. He also had an absolutely huge career. So he was born in 63 and died in 1944. Yeah. Um, that's a sort of Titian-esque. That's one of those long artistic careers like Titian or Dorothea Tanning or, you know, unlike Van Gogh, his near contemporary, who does everything within a 10-year period. Munch is painting for decades and decades from the... 1860s, really, uh, yeah. 1870s to the 1940s, effectively. Yeah. It's huge. Um, and one of the fascinating things about that vast output is how variable it is in quality. This is one of the things that's always spoken about, is that some of it's absolutely dreadful. Um, I mean, what, what's your view on that? Do, do you feel that... Do you feel there's a kind of essential monkness that uh, comes through even these very minor works that are hardly ever exhibited? Um, yeah, I have to say the starting point for this book was that I was asked to do an exhibition, a monk exhibition in Oslo by the Monk Museum. Uh, and I'm an amateur and I don't nothing, do know nothing about curating, but I said yes at once. And, and then I had a whole museum to my disposal and I could do whatever I want. And they showed me the, the uh, basement, the magazine, the, where they had all the paintings. And it is uh, a thousand paintings, I think. And it's all these huge, huge plates that you pull out. It's like they're five meters, and they're full with paintings. And there are some masterpieces, uh, some fantastic paintings, and are some really crap. And it's like, it's, it's, it's uh, everything he was surrounded with when he died. Normally when you see an exhibition you see something very curated and very put together, but this was kind of chaotic and, and like uh, a work in progress, frozen in time. And there were so many things I haven't seen there uh, before. Uh, and it was... So, so what I tried to do in the exhibition was, since we've seen Munch so much, and since it is iconic, and since we only see what we already know, is it possible to get you know, access to Munch you know, like going underneath or above those and into, into the other paintings. There's so many paintings he painted throughout his whole life. And that was what I tried to do in the exhibition. And the risk there is, of course, that the iconic paintings are iconic because they're very good. 
and not so iconic paintings are maybe not so good. And that's a very interesting question about what qualities, you know, mm. what is a good painting, what is a bad painting, what, what is this, you know? There's a really funny passage in the book. By the way, the book is neither a biography of Monk, nor is it a critical appraisal of Monk, although it has, I think, elements of both those things. I, I think really it's about the encounter with Monk. It's about you, Colin, who are trying to make sense of Monk. Does that feel right to you as a, as a kind of thumbnail description? Yeah, somehow uh, that's true. It's, it's uh, how Monk, you know, has, has been for me when I was a teenager and later and, and now. But, it, but I didn't want it to be a book about me and my relation to Monk. Yes. I'm interviewing a lot of artists. I'm interviewing a, a, sure. a film director, artists, uh, art professors, uh, to try to figure out who is Monk now for us and why is he important, is he important, what is it? And also the question, you know, what is art? What is visual art? How is it possible that there are so much contained in, in a so little you know, space as yeah. it could be in paintings? That's a mystery in the book. And it's kind of channeled through Monk's paintings because his life and his career and everything with him, I find interesting. So that was brackets, <laughs> because what I was going to say is that um, uh, there's, a, there's a very funny passage. I mean, it's enlightening, but it is funny when you are in the, the store of the, um, of the Monk Museum, uh, looking through the paintings with an art critic yeah. who approaches the paintings from an extremely technical perspective. He's a former painter himself. He has quite a formalist view of um, the works, he has very strong views on, you know, passages that are less well made than other passages and paintings. And I had this kind of sense of, of the two of you having really quite different ideas about quality. <laughs> you, you're very open about that you felt terribly sort of anxious and inadequate in the face of this formalist expertise. Yeah, yeah, because I had, you couldn't imagine if you had, you know, a British Museum to your disposal and you're an amateur and you could do whatever you want and you just do this and an exhibition is going to open and it's going to come a hundred thousand people, you know, <laughs> and you don't know what you're doing. And then you have an art critic, you go through with him and he says, you know, no, this, this is a really failure, this picture, you know, the, I didn't tell him what was in the exhibition or not, he didn't know, he was just, you know, uh, going through it from, from his perspective, and he's incredibly good. He wrote maybe the best book about Monk. What he's good at is, is, is to get to the level of the painter when he painted it. What was his ambition? What did he try to do? Where did he fail? Where did he go right? What's good? What's bad? But very technical, as you say. And then he kind of dismissed, like, maybe, yeah, maybe like 70% so or so of, of, uh, of, all, of, of all the exhibition. And this was like, you know, a few weeks before it was opening. And, and, and the anxiety was real, but this is going to be a disaster, you know? The interesting thing is that Munch, when he was, he grew up in Oslo in um, 1870s. It's a very provincial city doesn't have access to many paintings really. So it's, it's much like uh, national romanticism. There are some, some uh, naturalism paintings. Um, and he has, I think he, he was gifted as a painter. Uh, he, he painted some, you know, really beautiful paintings as 17, 18, 19 year old, full of light and life. And, and not at all gloomy as he, as he later was known, known of. But, what happened to him was that he, his um, mother died when he was young, and then he was very much attached to his sister. She died also uh, when they were teenagers, and he almost died. And another sister was schizophrenic, and, and it was a lot, of, a lot of those things going on in his life. And I think he wanted to express that. I think he wanted to paint that. And I think there was no language, pictorial language available to him. And then when he was, I think he must have been 22, he started to paint the death of his sister, which is kind of a genre painting. A lot of other painters did that. It's a dying girl in a room. But this room is, the monk's room is like completely distorted somehow. He painted on that painting for a year. And you know, you can see he's trying to paint, remove, painting, removing. And it's like the, 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 the whole room is, is distorted, there's no longer no room, it's, it's, it's like the scene is in our room. 
And then it's also he's painting what he remembered, how his sister died, but he also has a model. So there's kind of a collision of, of, of what was past and what is now. And this painting looks like nothing, you know, that the contemporary paintings did at all. Uh, it's extremely powerful to us. But then he, he, he had an exhibition in Oslo, and you know, it wasn't even a scandal, but people were laughing. You know? This is his dead sister. He, he has you know, spent a year painting it, and, and people are just laughing. You know, ha ha, look at that, how, how silly, how stupid. You know? That was kind of that was, uh, the courage he had and where, where he came from. And you could see that throughout his life, I think, that, that, that he was willing to sacrifice everything he knew to find something, you know? And if you do that, then you are bound to fail, then you are bound to make stupid things. But you also, if you continue to do that, you might stumble over something valuable, you know? I mean, what's interesting in a way is that he kept everything. Yes, because exactly. Because uh, lots of painters destroy, and he didn't, he kept everything, no, no, no. and he left it to the municipality of Oslo. So yeah, yeah. he clearly saw some value in these failures. Yeah, it's, it's also interesting that he had no, he obviously, you know, art was very important for him, but, but the objects itself, the paintings, they were out in the snow, they were up in the trees, they were on the floor, they walked on it. It was like, there was no value in them, so he treated it very carelessly. Uh, and I think he kind of did when he painted also, there's a kind of careless restlessness in, in him and in all his paintings. And it's not like he, he can't paint, of course he can paint, but it, it's his looking for something all the time. And I, Is it this questing quality, this sort of restlessness, this yeah. attempting to express something to, to... I mean, you do this in... I mean, I know you don't really perhaps want to talk about it yourself, but I do think there is that in you of, of um, sort of wanting to cut through almost technique and, um, yeah. and try, to, try to get to something that actually achieve something emotional yeah. that yeah. strips away language or materiality, even though um, that's a paradox because you have to use paint and you have to use language. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. I think almost every artist or writer or, or film director want to, to, to get there, you know, through, uh, you know, the, the technical things, uninteresting, everything that you know is uninteresting because you want, you want to go to this place. Uh, That's why I think your art critic it has a less interesting, although I haven't read his book and I believe you when you say it's marvellous, yeah. but that's why I think that a very formalist approach is not necessarily particularly helpful. It would be like asking you about exactly how you put words in order, which might have, it's probably not as interesting as asking you um, other stuff, you know, <laughs> less, <laughs> less formalist. Yeah, so. but, but it gets complicated because with Monk, uh, he obviously, um, he knew a lot about paintings. His first painting when he was 17, 18, is like, uh, almost like Baroque portraits, for instance, with a lot of volume and, and, and an incredibly beautiful faces mm. that he could do. Uh, and then he did this sick girl thing that is unique in his, his he, he didn't, he, he stopped doing that. And then he has his most famous paintings, which is so completely the different. So that's 1890s. Yeah. So, I mean, the so, intriguing, if he died in 1890, like Van Gogh, yeah. that would have been a very, <laughs> the whole period of these famous pictures that we all recognize as being Munchian, yeah. melancholy, yeah. jealousy, the scream, yeah. wouldn't have happened. And he would have been a rather an eccentric painter who's painted this peculiar picture of the sick room, which may or may not have become famous. It's yeah, a exactly. Sort of, um, yeah. It was like he, he found a, a solution in the 1890s of all his problems when he was young. So he, he started almost to paint formalized, you know. Uh, he was in, he been a very literary, if you have seen melancholy or jealousy, it's like it's a, a little story, you oh. know. And it's nothing about paintings or the things, it's more like an iconic, you know. Uh, you get it at once and it's not a painterly quality, it's the image, it's the iconic image that you see. And it's about his own memories. So he's, he's painting his own memories, and they're extremely charged, you know, in an almost adolescent way. It's like it's like uh, it's like Dostoevsky almost, mm. in in that sense. And he gets famous through that, and then he, 
completely uh, stopped doing that and started doing something completely different for 40 years. And so he's known for like seven years of painting, that's Monk, and then he continued for 50 years painting completely different, uh, do, trying lots of different mm. things. And, and these paintings are not charged. These paintings are not full of those kind of anxiety and all those emotions. It's very, very different. Some of them are almost like they're not charged with anything. It's just a forest or just trees or, and, and it starts to, to, to be or interesting maybe, in, in another way. Or a cabbage field and I'm just giving him a rather, I'm giving him a cue. I'm wondering if you might like yeah. to read to us yeah. about, um, I insisted that we all had a handout tonight because we don't have the capability to show uh, big images, but um, Carl is going to very kindly read a section about the first image that you see in front of you, the cabbage field. Yes, yeah, so this is an example of a late monk. This really is nothing. Sometimes it is impossible to say why and how a work of art achieves its effect. I can stand in front of a painting and become filled with emotions and thoughts, evidently transmitted by the painting, and yet it is impossible to trace those emotions and thoughts back to it and say, for example, that the sorrow came from the colors, or that the longing came from the brush strokes, or that the sudden insight that life will end lay in the motif. One picture I feel this way about was painted by Edvard Munch in 1915. It depicts a cabbage field. The cabbages in the foreground are roughly executed, almost sketch-like, dissolving into green and blue brushstrokes deeper into the background. Next to the cabbage field, there is an area of yellow, over that an area of dark green, and over that again a narrow band of darkening sky. That is all, that is the whole painting. But the picture is magical. It is so charged with meaning. Looking at it, I feel as if something is bursting within me. And yet, it is just a field of cabbages. So what is going on with this painting? When I look at its colors and shapes, which are so radically simplified that they suggest the landscape more than they represent it, I see death. As if the painting intended a reconciliation with death but a trace of something terrible remains. And what is terrible is the unknown, that we don't know what awaits us. But Munch's painting doesn't really say anything, doesn't give form to anything other than cabbages, grain, trees, and sky. And yet death, and yet reconciliation, and yet peace, and yet a trace of something terrible. Is it simply that the line of the field leads inwards towards darkness and that dusk is descending in the sky above? Perhaps, but many have painted fields, many have painted dusk without attaining what this painting so calmly radiates. Munch was around 50 years old when he painted Cabbage Field. He was known as a painter of the inner life of dream, death and sexuality. He had gone through a life crisis after that, he withdrew from social life, and he no longer sought out pain when he painted. He turned outwards, he painted the sun. And that isn't hard to understand. Everything begins anew when the sun rises. Darkness yields, the day opens up, the world once again becomes visible. Over the next 30 years, he painted what he saw, saw there in the visible world. But the visible world is not objective reality. It appears to each individual as seen by them. And Munch's great gift lay in his ability to paint not only what his gaze took in, but also what that gaze was charged with. There is a longing in this painting of the cabbage field, a longing to disappear and become one with the world. And that longing to disappear and become one with the world fulfilled the painting for him, fulfilled for him the act of painting. That is why this painting is so good. What disappears re-emerge in what comes into being. And if the disappearance ceased for the painter as soon as he finished the painting, it is still represented in the picture, which fills us again and again with its emptiness. Cabbages, grain and forest, yellow and green, blue and orange. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. So 
kind of a, how can a painting contain so much when on the one hand it contains, as you say, only cabbages, grain and forest? I mean, is the content coming from you? That's... Or is, how is it working? Um, or is it drawing on a repertoire of gestures that we understand to have metaphorical content somehow, the disappearing line or the darkening horizon that we sort of translate into uh, almost literary metaphor to create meaning from? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I can only tell you know what this painting is for me and what it represents for me and, and it's... I had an experience with Munch when I was 19 in, in Bergen, and it was, it was a painting not very unsimilar to this. It was a, it was a, a field with, covered with snow, and, and I don't know, I'm writing a bit about it in the book also, but it's, it's, it's like uh, Munch is somehow managed to be without God when he's looking at something. And it's, it's like he's managed to transform his own emotions into the painting somehow. Uh, and, and you can get access to it. I mean, if you look at the cabbage field, it doesn't evoke almost anything. But this is charged with someone who is looking at it. And it's, that's where the mystery is, you know. I don't know. Maybe you, don't, maybe you see something completely different. But I, I feel this is coming, you know, something very emotionally coming from these, these paintings. I don't know. And I wonder, I mean, I sometimes think about this when I'm writing about art, just how, you know, how odd it is in a way to express. I mean, when you talk to painters, or when I talk to painters, I quite often feel like I've never understood anything from the conversation. No. Because painters, the, 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 the the obsessions and um, requirements of painters mentally are so different from people who write. I mean, they're working in a language and the language is paint. It's not, yeah. ready, it's not easy to translate no. that language into a spoken or no, no. a written language. And um, I find that I often want to narrativize paintings because that's, you know, I want to know what the story is. Yeah. Um, particularly, say, with Renaissance paintings, and, and a painter friend will look at it, look at a, a you know, a, a Raphael as a colour field painting, you know, strips of content except for, except for how the colours relate to each other, for example. I mean, how, how do you feel about that? Do you. Do you think about that when you're writing about art? I mean, how do you how do you relate to the visual in, in your in your work? I mean, do you feel that you can adequately express this, or translate uh, the painted surface into into words? Um, no, I have been writing when I look back incredibly much about painting. Yeah, uh, yeah but, and it has. You know, it's, it's, it's like painting somehow represents life, represents the way we are in the world, because it's, 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 uh, it's just, uh, it doesn't go through concepts, it doesn't go through, you know, explanations, it's just there, you see it, like you see, you see a person, you know, and you, and you sense it, and you know, you know, I, I know, I have a sense of you, and I have, you know, an idea of you, and I have, I see your face, and I, but I haven't, I haven't explained it to myself or, or anything, but I just, that's what, that, that's you, you know, and, you, and the same instant relation you have to paintings. And I feel very jealous, and I've always done so for painters, because that's what I want to do in my writing. It's like all the concepts, all the words are a detour, I have to break through almost, or, or, you know, to, to get to, to somewhere much more emotional and much more not intellectual and much more Im immediate. And, and I think that's why I've always been interested in art. And writing about art is, I don't know why I'm doing it, but it is, feels like it's so essential somehow. Uh, but I end the book with, with following, because that's, I just read the last sentence, because it is, it is about that. 
in themselves picture are beyond words, beyond concepts, beyond thought. They invoke the presence of the world on the world's terms, which also means that everything that has been thought and written in this book stops being valid the moment your gaze meets the canvas. That, but I, that's how I think it is. I mean, you can't, yeah. And I think the, 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 the reason painters or artists they don't talk about their works and, and they have to protect their work somehow. Mm. Mm. And you just can't. This like, that just doesn't meet. I mean, the, the way we talk about pictures and the picture, there's no, they don't meet. There's two different circuits, you know, I think. And the, you've worked with artists, you're, you're, the, the Seasons Quartet was illustrated, although that may be quite the wrong word. It had, it, they contained images yeah. commissioned from, or, from people like Anselm Kiefer, for example. Yeah. Um, what was the impulse behind that and how did you find working with artists in that sense? Kiefer was, uh, I've always, I always, he has always been important to me, but in a very strange way. It's like it's, his paintings are very, they're not personal in any way, they're not biographical in any way. I remember seeing his retrospective here in London a few years ago, and it's, it's these massive paintings, and, and there's no trace of him, but they are still filled and charged with emotions, and, but it's like they're coming from, from a place. They're not personal, you can't you know, find, find Anselm Kiefer in this because he deals with a big subject, with history, with, you know. Uh, and then at the end of that show, there was little uh, um, watercolors of uh, uh, women, water, buildings. They were so extremely beautiful and extremely colorful and extremely personal. And I realized all of a sudden that Anselm Kiefer actually exists. He's a person. I can contact him. And I did. I wrote him. A, I wrote him a letter. He's alive. I yeah, exactly. And, he, and, he, and I wrote him a letter. And six months later, I got an, an answer. Yes, you can come and, and visit me at my studio, uh, and you can choose some paintings for your book. And, and I did. And I did that. And I went down there. And, and that was um, that was an incredibly experience in itself. But it is somehow also related to Munch, and I do write about that in the book because. If you, if you think about uh, where Munch came, Munch came from, where you had uh, pictures that was filled, that was, had a space and time, and something happened in that room, the space that was surrounded by gave a kind of a, almost like a comfort, because you know, uh, something new will appear in that space. And it's, it's like, it's, 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 uh, it's a very different pictorial space from what Munch made. He will kind of crush that, made it all instant. It's here and now, and it's us in the same room, and it's the scream. If you can imagine you see a scream in a naturalist painting, it would be completely different. It would be, you know, a landscape around and a little man screaming, and it would be, in scream, it's like everything is subordinated to the main figure. And I, when I have, you know, went and saw Kiefer and saw his paintings. And then there was a, an exhibition in, in London in the White Cube. That was kind of the exact opposite. And I, I thought maybe Scream is, we live in the Scream now. Everything is instant. Everything comes to us. Every suffering. There's no space. There's no Does space. It, it's yeah. like it's, something happens two minutes, somewhere in the world two minutes later, it's, it's in our face, you know. That's Scream. And then I saw the exhibition in a white cube with Kiefer, which there's no people in it. There's no persons. There's only space and mm. time. And time like eternal time almost, you know? And, 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 and it was, I thought, yeah, that's, that's what we need now. We need the space. We need the time. We need- When you we, say it contained only time and space, what yeah. do you mean? It's- um, I've read it, so I know. <laughs> but. No, 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 but, but well, it's-, it's um, I don't know. There is when we come. It contained in, objects. It was a kind of the exhibition itself. You come in the yeah. exhibition. There was a lot of beds. Uh, with you could see all the things, the beds, clothes, and you know this, this. What do you call it? The little scrunches or whatever, like people just have left. But it was all in lead. So that moment of just now could be 
2,000 years old, you know. That was the feeling mm. you got first when you came in there. Mm. And there's a lot of mythology references there. And what is a myth? You know, it's, it's, if you take the, the myth about Cain and Abel, for instance, from the Bible, it's a brother killing a brother. Uh, it, it's take up a huge space in our culture. It, it is, you know, something of significance and it's a story we can talk about and retell. And we have done so for 2,000 years. And then you can imagine if something like that happened in, you know, in a Swedish city, a brother kills a brother. It's, it's really it's nothing, it's forgotten. It's the same as a scene from a war. It's forgotten, happens, forgotten, but you have it in the midst and then it's kind of fixed and you can see it and you can, you know. That was key, that is what Kiefer, Kiefer mm. is doing. There was, there was wars going on at that time with it, this exhibition and some of the pictures reminded of, of that, the deserts and, mm. and you know, uh, uh, smoke coming up and, and, and it was kind of, very spookily reminded of that, but I asked him and he, no, no, that's just what he's doing and he's doing that for so many years, you know, mm. working with this. But he, he gives space to the world, he gives space to us, he, he gives space to history, it's, it's, But yeah. what you're talking about is the, it seems to me, is the, um, the fact that, of course, art is activated by the moment in which you see it. Yeah. So Scream seems to aptly, um, sum up our moment yeah. just because we're looking at it now yeah. and um, Anselm Kiefer's work meant something different in the 70s in relation to its moment than his work does yeah, in yeah, 2019 yeah. which is just a fact of how you activate you know that the kind of chemical reaction between the artwork the person and the and the time it's a yeah, yeah. it's a kind of that's true triangle. that's true um. And it's interesting that it seems like there is a kind of a zeitgeist, you know, there is a kind of a, a common thing in, in, in the art world, for instance. So if you see paintings from the 1890s, you recognize them from the time period, you know, or, or from the 1970s, you recognize it, okay, it's 1970s. And most of those artworks are impossible to see or impossible to, to use or impossible to, because they, they, they only represent that time. But the artworks that uh, transgress the time is the one that was once was very individual, that once kind of break with, with, with the zeitgeist. And that's the one that's representative. So the representative painting from the 1890s is the one that was very personal. And that was, for instance, Albert Monk's The yeah. Scream. And yeah, that's just a... It's just an extraordinary, I mean, you know, it seems impossible that someone could be that original. Do you know what I mean? It, it, original, you know, for something to be judged original, um, to, to, to sort of throw aside, well, you talk about the, the things that have already been painted on the blank canvas before the painter starts to paint, the kind of Deleuze thing. The, the, you know, being able to remove yourself from the conditions of your time and create something that will exist outside time or will, will have that kind of activation, will activate our gaze when we look at it 70, 80, 100, 200 years later. It's, um, it's a miracle. We all want to do that, don't we? <laughs> I think you did do it. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk to you, I wanted to ask you, shifting slightly away from that idea, to um, your experience of going and looking at Munch's own haunts, his house, his studio, the places that he was. You, you, you talk in, in the book about visiting with a filmmaker various places where Munch had been, all of which seemed to be almost exactly the same, and they still had Munch's letters on the wall of Munch's bed. I mean, this was all completely extraordinary. I mean, how did they, you were a little bit uncertain about? Um, there's something, a, there's something a bit embarrassing about sort of being a tourist in the footsteps of the great artist. Yeah. You, how did you? But 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 it can be a strangely moving experience. I, can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, it, it was very strange uh, because um, so, at least for Norwegian, so many of Munch's paintings are iconic, so you, so you know them very well, you have seen them, and, and 
and they are also kind of universal, you know, these are universal feelings, universal uh, ideas. Uh, so you could see it whenever you are in the world and, and it will make sense and you think this is, you know. But then we came to a little place called Åsgårdstrand where he had a little cabin um, and we walked around there and, and we could see all the places from the paintings. We could see, okay, that's the beach where melancholy was, was made, you know. Oh, that was the road, you know, it was like, so it was so local and it was so, you know, like a hundred meters in each direction. That was it. That was a complete universe almost. That was, that was very, very strange to see. But I, I do believe it's like that. I think the only way to reach something universal or that will, you know, could reach many people is to go through the local, is to go through where you are, because everybody will always be local, you know. But that was, that was, uh, that was very strange. Did that, I, th I think I'm right in remembering, that activated in you this sort of idea, allowed you to imagine this character called Monk just walking around being an ordinary person <laughs> without being Monk, <laughs> who was a jobbing painter. The future was not visible to him. His no. reputation, you know, the idea that we're talking about him now was unknown to him. Um, and there's a, I was also thinking about that in relation to Van Gogh, because there's a big Van Gogh exhibition um, opening at Tate Britain. Um, well, I think it's just opened. And you talk about Van Gogh a bit in, in your book as well. But the, I suppose Van Gogh and Munch are kind of on a similar plane of being commodified to within an inch of their lives. And every, every step they took is sort of... Um, documented and there were little tourist areas in these villages uh -huh. in, in Holland where Van Gogh lived and so on. And, and part of it is incredibly cringeworthy. And as you say, part of it is actually quite sort of strange and humbling and you can stand in that place and see that church. Uh -huh. um, but, but with this sense of how horrified perhaps each of those per people would be. I mean, I don't know about Monk. Would he be horrified to see um, how commodified, would he be excited and happy that he was now so famous? He would be very excited and very happy. He was, uh, <laughs> he was a very vain, vain person, very, uh, very, very narcissistic as a person and, and uh, yeah, and he would... He, and he was commercially successful, unlike Van Gogh. He was and he did a lot to achieve that also, uh, he really did. So, but it's, it's interesting to see Van Gogh and, and Munch in the same, because they started out painting at the same time. Uh, after 10 years, Munch have hardly achieved anything. But he lived on to paint, you know, 50 more years. And, and Van Gogh, everything Van Gogh painted, he painted in within 10 within years. 10 years. Yeah. And he started out without... Any training. And he couldn't paint. You know, you can see that here, he can't paint. And he, has, he can't choose between anything. Munch was very eclectic and, and very clever and, and good, so he could choose, you know. He could paint impressionistic, he could paint realistic, he could paint, you know. So he had kind of a lot of options. So his problem was, I need to unlearn, I need to, to get away all I know to try to, you know. But for Van Gogh, that was never an option. He had nothing to unlearn. He had, to, he had so only what he got. They were traveling in opposite directions. Munch was clearing away the debris of his training yeah. and Van Gogh was desperately teaching yeah, yeah. himself some skills. Yeah, yeah, and you see he get better and better and better and more and more intense, you know, like, like, and then it's like when you see his paintings chronologically, you understand, okay, he has to die. It's almost like that because intensity is so wild in, in the end for Munch wasn't like that. He had... Although they were both hospitalised for mental illness, weren't they? Didn't Monk spend some time... In yeah, he had, a, he had a completely breakdown. Oh, yeah, that's true. He was... Uh, when he was young, he was more and more alcoholic and he was more and more paranoid. And he was travelling around in Europe. He was almost like hunted by women. He tried to escape them and then in the end he collapsed. Hunted by women? Yeah. Sometimes if they're carrying spears. He was, he was, yeah, he was, he was so unwilling to commit to anyone. Uh, I think he was because he, he lost his mother, he lost his sister, he, he, he didn't, he couldn't commit. Mm. And that was also, you know, a, a, in his paintings, that's a, a topic and a subject in his painting, paintings. Yeah, and then he had this completely breakdown and after that he stopped painting uh, things that was related to his life or related inwards, only outwards. And that was a way, of, of course, to, to live and uh, not to die for him. Well, talking of that might be a good moment to um, um, make this conversation more general and um, offer 
you the opportunity to ask any questions you might have. While you're just thinking about that, I'm going to tell you that Claire has got a roving mic. So do stick your hand in the air. Um, great. There's a question here. Sorry, I'm coming. Well done. Hi, yeah, I, I went to the Van Gogh, funny enough, today. I'm nothing to do with that. I'm, I'm a writer. And, but what I find quite interesting about what you're talking about <clears throat> is uh, our fixation maybe with things that aren't tragic, that, that, that have depths of despair in them. And the sort of weird way that it was laid out for me, the exhibition as well, sorry, I got a bit of a cold, um, was that the sort of ex ex the last room is a bit like an apology to, you know, it's not all that bad really. And there's a sort of, this is the artist that were, you know, came from his work and everything. I was like, but you know, to look at his sorrow and I could hear people talking, they're going, yes, it's, it's sad, but it's not just sad. It's like the sort of obsession, the modern obsession with finding the good, finding the airbrush and everything. And I wondered in a long-winded way, whether that fixation is what propels a lot of your work as well as to find, I've read your struggles. Uh, when my dad was dying, it was a struggle. I didn't like you at all. I was angry with you. I put you down a lot of times. Um, but what I found very beguiling was this idea of imperfection, of always looking for something that's not necessarily perfect. And in the modern world, I wonder if that's in some way the propeller of a lot of what instigates a lot of your work and, and Monk is, is, is the need that imperfection in itself tells its own story, you know, that it, it, it takes you to another place, despair, anxiety, you know. Um, and I think somewhere in our modern world, we're very scared of that. My mum comes from the Balkans. There's a lot of heavy stuff going on there, but they were free people, but they went through hell. And I, somewhere we're not really absorbing that now in the modern world. I don't think we're as close to despair as we should be, maybe, I don't know. I have a question yeah. for Carla Knauskard. Imperfection, I think, was the key word. Yeah, and also um, what Monk did, if you see the two, his two faces, it, 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 one is to confront, you know, confront things and confront the world and confront. And the second face is more to hide. And both is, you know, in art and in, in, in writing. It's both thing at the same time, really. So you could, you could confront difficult things and do, you know, write about horrible things and at the same time be protected by, just by the act of writing, by being in the language, being in literature. And I think the same thing is, is, is with, with, with paintings. Um, but it sort of contains, it's a way of containing something. Uh, yes, it's a place to hide, uh, uh, I think, and it's, it's a place to, um, to deal with things and, and in the world in, in, a, in a safe space, you know. And that place has to be safe. I mean, you have to be, don't have anyone looking in, you don't have anyone criticizing, you don't have anyone saying, no, you can't do that. And that's the place Monk found, that's why he could do all of this. This is this important question about shame, isn't it? I yeah. think that sense that, um, well, an artist friend of mine once said that he didn't think anything was worthwhile unless he felt ashamed of it afterwards. Yeah. I think the key word is afterwards, actually, because yeah. you can't you can't make something with shame in the room, or else you just wouldn't. No, start. no, you can't. No, no, no. That's that's You have true. to be kind of naked in the room. Yeah, yeah, and you have to were. be like in a protected almost like a protected environment and you have, you have to do that and, and then when you are giving it to someone, showing it to someone, exhibit it or whatever, then is, is the shame come, come pouring in and, and if you do, I mean shame is all about transgression, you have transgressed, you know, and, and that's what you do as an artist. And that so. might lead you to this originality, in fact, it's in other yeah. words, the transgressing the, the boundaries that are set by the culture is where that might lead you to somewhere new. So this shame is yeah. At useful. least if, if you are like a northern European Protestant sure. yeah. person, Europe, it's Europe, it's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I you know, yeah. as I told you, I met Kiefer, and he seems to be a very shameless person. So, <laughs> but it's very good though. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So as a, yes, as a fellow northern European Protestant, I understand your language. Um, any more questions? There's a hand there. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, yeah, to, to go back to the uh, comparison between Van Gogh and uh, Monk, I, I wondered if some great artists have a kind of uh, sort of afterlife uh, period. Uh, obviously, Van Gogh didn't, but Monk, I wonder if he had, you know, his his phase of great art and then a much longer phase afterward in which it was a kind of, well, the only word I can think of is a kind of afterlife of of uh, diminishment, or is that not the case? Is his sort of good and bad quality arts distributed evenly throughout his career, or, or is there a sort of a long period of afterlife? Um, yeah, well, I think he was, his fame was rising uh, from the 1890s, so he kind of had that in his back throughout his, his active life, that he has his good work behind him. And I think that work has also been, that's what we think about when we think about Monk, is that work, what he did in the 1890s. Uh, so the, the, for me, you know, to be able to exhibit works that had never been shown before, that was amazing. And that was, that was kind of the great joy of, of doing that show, was exactly that. Uh, because they, you know, you have, a certain image of an artist, and it's, it's, it's right, but if you start to look and, and you see the whole thing, then that uh, kind of focus disappears, and, and you, you realize it's, it's very, very different, but that's very hard to handle. It's too complex, it's too many things, you know, so, so it's much easier to think of Munk of the Scream, and that's it. And, and, but it's, um, I've, you know, I find the same thing with almost all artists. If you see something you haven't seen before, something maybe or, or even of lesser quality it is it feels like it's what it, it was intentionally when, when it when you know when it, when it was made comes to you and you, because you don't know anything about it all the others you you know too much or often there's a question on the front row thank you Hello. Hi. Um, I, I, I noticed um, from skimming your the book on Monk and um, from reading, um, I think it was Summer, <laughs> um, uh, the comparison that's cropped up, I think, a couple of times between uh, Monk um, and Dostoevsky. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you might want to expand on that. And I, th I think if I've understood you about Dostoevsky, um, you admire him, you prefer him to Tolstoy, which I agree with, well done. <laughs> um, but you, you, you connect with this feeling of, um, like, I think you describe Tolstoy as, as ultimately a cynic, but somebody that can understand innocence. I, I, sorry. There we yeah, go. no. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. When Monk was young, um, I think, he had, I think the, the, uh, the reason for making the scream, the reason for making the sick girl, for going in that direction, had very much to do with Dostoevsky. But I think in Dostoevsky, I know that Monk read Dostoevsky as, 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 as a young man. And um, I'm sure he wanted, he saw there a possibility to achieve something that he wanted to achieve. Uh, and, I read Sue Pridor's wonderful biography about Munch, which is uh, probably the best that is written about him. And in that book, uh, she states that the last thing he did before he died, the day he died, he read Dostoevsky, the obsessed. So it was a lifelong thing for him. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think that's very important. The sketchiness in his paintings, the unfinished thing in, in his paintings, the kind of completely focus on the emotions in the paintings, uh, which all connects to Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky doesn't care about, you know, details or if, you know, the thing is, it, it's just, he goes straight to it. And Tolstoy, uh, which I think is, the older I get, the more good I think he is. <laughs> so, but his, 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 you know, his scenes are complete, his sentences are beautiful, he takes time, he, he paints the whole canvas. Dostoevsky doesn't. Munch never paints the whole canvas. He's kind of very sloppy, and if you see his painting, it's like 
places that don't know paint at all, and because he just don't care, he wants something, he wants this, and you know, that's what he's, he's, he's going for. He doesn't care about quality, and Dostoevsky doesn't, didn't care about quality, you could see that. You know. Interesting, good question, thank you. And there's a hand here, in the second row. I was just wondering if you could please elaborate on your thoughts on making quality judgments, both um, when you are judging Monk's work or where you're making quality judgments, and also in terms of um, making quality judgments as you go along creating something. So, judgment. Uh... Yeah, how did you decide, I think, whether Monk's paintings were good or not? And how do you make judgments about the quality of your own work? Um... That's a good question. Uh, I didn't. I try not to think about quality when I choose paintings. I try to. Uh, to build a room. I had four rooms at disposal. I built to build a room uh, that had one kind of should come something from that room. Should be very different rooms. So I made a kind of a, a, a little, little narrative. So it starts things in, on the outside. Uh, it's very harmonic. It's the sun, it's uh, the sea, it's bathing children. It's a, it's a very uh, non-gloomy monk. And then you come into the next room filled with uh, trees, nature, more and more empty. In the end, it's nothing, it's just ice. And then you go in the inner, to the inner, the, the inner room, which is, you know, completely chaotic, which is the inside of, of a person, and then out to the portraits. That was kind of the lead I had, and then I tried to find paintings that kind of worked in that context and did something in the room. And for Munch, it was very important that the paintings wasn't one painting, but it was how that painting related to that painting. And if you took that painting away and put another one, there would be a different thing. And that was what he, he wasn't interested in masterpieces. He was interested in connection between paintings. And that's what I tried to do it was almost like writing, you know. You have a chapter. You have you have a. It's, it's like you make a room, and and you, you yeah. It's, it's a very very visual, visual experience. And for, when it comes to my own writing, I have no idea at all about what's quality and not quality. I am completely dependent upon my editor to say, and I, I don't. I just don't know. Uh, it's like it's it's impossible to say. But uh, one good thing is if if I'm about to be shameful. That could either me mean that it's terrible or that it is something extraordinary. And I better than never know. So it could be both. And, and the more I think about the quality, the, the worse I'm writing, you know. It's, yeah, it's true. And, and the more I try to elaborate and make sentences good, the worse it is. Because it isn't about that for me then, you know. So I have, but I, to be able to write, I've stopped thinking quality, I've stopped thinking, you know, masterpiece or whatever, I just write and publish, that's what I do, and then, you know, you got something maybe good, and then maybe not so good, and then maybe, you know, 10 years later, maybe this, and because what's the value for me is to be in it, that's, it's not to have the books, but it's to be in it, and, and that's what I try to do, and I think, uh, since I wrote a book about Monk, people said, you know, what do you have in common, or whatever, but I think, I've learned that from him, that kind of attitude. Just don't care, just be in it and, and see what happens. If it's bad, okay, that's bad, but you know. But you were present, as it were. It was, something happened. There was an action. <laughs> that's the important thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the moment of writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I can see exactly that that would be the meeting point with Monk. Yeah. On which note, I just, before we thank Karl Uwe, and before we, we sort of escort him gently to the, oh, well, in fact, I think this is our signing table. We will stay here and Carl Uwe will sign books and um, continue the conversation. Um, Carl Uwe, I wondered if you would read that very final passage, yeah. um, which relates to um, the last, the third image in the handout, students. Um, and we will finish, we will finish right there when, when Colleen has finished this reading. Okay. 
One of the last pictures he painted was Painter by the Wall. It dates from 1942 and depicts a man standing on a ladder painting the wall of a house. It has nothing to do with Munch's inner life. It is a scene of everyday life that just happens to occur where he is and which he paints. He doesn't even paint it particularly well, but quickly and carelessly. The painter's body is hardly more than a couple of brush strokes, and the background just a little hastily raked up green, signifying grass and shrubs, and some yellow and red-brown shapes indicating flowers. In the background, there is a red barn. It lends depth to the picture and draws the viewer in, in the simplest way imaginable. We can't get much further from the distorted, fearful face and the mood dominating his most famous painting, The Scream. There is no doubt about what The Scream expresses, nor that it is a painting of the highest order. It is up there with Van Gogh's cornfields and Picasso's Guernica. But a house painter on a ladder one fine day in the garden? The Impressionists' elevated motives such as this by capturing the moment in all its fullness and in that way trying the familiar and tying the familiar and the everyday, that with which we are most intimate, to what lies just beyond the everyday and which one can sense on a summer day, that in the world which doesn't care about us, which doesn't care about anything, which merely exists and which merely exists always, the eternal. There is nothing eternal about Munch's painter as he stands there on the ladder with a body made up of a couple of brush strokes of white and beige. No eternity in the garden around him or in the barely glimpsed sky. No inner meaning, nor any meaning extract from the external world. Just a carelessly rendered scene of everyday life, virgin and insignificant in every direction. Is this where 64 years of experience as a painter had brought him? In a certain way, a sense it was. Munch knew perfectly well how to paint a man on a ladder in a way that was photographic, realistic, and anatomically correct. The studies he drew of the human body as a young man in Paris are technically perfect. He also knew well how to paint a man in a garden on a summer day impressionistically. And he presumably also knew how to paint a man on the ladder in a Monkian way. When he chose not to, it was because none of those techniques would help him accomplish what he was after. On the contrary, they would stand in his way. But what was he after? It can't have been much. It wasn't to create great art. It wasn't to paint a masterpiece. It was simply to capture the essence of this little scene. The essence of the house painter, which is the vertical act arc of the body ending in the lifted hand holding the brush. The essence of the ladder, which is the slightly rickety horizontal steps. The essence of the flowers and the grass, which is the yellow and green color. Munch must have been happy seeing the painter standing there. And he must have been happy painting him. For that is what the painting express, joy at the scene unfolding. Perhaps he also remembered another garden with a red building in the background, which he once painted joyfully in his youth. There is something slightly humorous about this picture too, the small and crookedly set up ladder, the man's arm far above his head, while at the same time there is also a respect for the work, simply through the fact that Munch found the motif worthy of a painting, nothing elevated, just worthy of note. When we know that Munch was 78 years old when he painted it and was considered to be beyond doubt his country's greatest artist, to many the very emblem of the artist, it is difficult not to see the picture as an ironic comment on his own life's work. The man on the ladder is painting a house. Munch is painting a picture. What difference is there really? Munch painted a self-portrait at about the same time. It is one of his best known pictures. It is entitled Between the Clock and the Bed. And it is unlike almost all of his other self-portraits in that he depicts himself humbly as a humble man. He's standing between a clock with no hands and a bed in front of a wall hung with pictures and paintings of which some are recognizable as his own. His hands are down by his sides in a neutral position verging on the subservient or self-effacing, it says. Here I am as I really am. His facial expression is also neutral, conveying neither affect nor inner drama. 
His gaze, which has been so central to his work and his position in the world, isn't visible. His eyes are almost entirely in shadow. It is as if he has positioned himself in front of us, and in doing so is saying that this is all there is, this is me, neither more nor less. The picture of the house painter is not a self-portrait, but it invites reflection about what painting meant to Munch through the difference between the man who is painting the house there amid the world and Munch who is painting a picture of it. He too standing amid the world, but not in it the same way. For while the color with which the house painter coats the walls is also in the world as matter, the colors which Munchs lay upon the canvas, in addition, creates another world. It is this world we see when we look at the picture. The connection between the two worlds can be more or less obvious, but Munch never let go of it, not even in his wildest experiments. And here it is as if the connection itself were the main thing that the world in itself and the painting of it are placed side by side through the similarity between the two acts, the painter painting the house, Munch painting the picture. Unlike the self-portrait between the clock and the bed, this picture is full of the joy of living, humor, and a faint undercurrent of melancholy. For although the painting in itself is insignificant and perhaps hardly worth a mention, it has never been exhibited. It is part of a clear and a strong theme in Munch, of people working, people in nature, and these pictures are harmonious and beautiful. Often the people are stretching their arms into the air, they are picking berries, they are lifting wooden planks, they are gripping branches, they are painting a house wall, and their faces are never visible. Their identity is not what is important, not who they are, but that they are, and that they merge with nature as a part of it. These pictures are invariably melancholy, for they are always seen from a distance. The person seeing them is not there himself is not himself part of the harmony, other than the one found in the act of painting itself, the only way of celebrating life that he knew by turning away from it. Thank you so much, Colin. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you.